Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the, let me repeat, the Rock and Roll Podcast. Check out this record. My name is Mark. With me, as always, is my good buddy, Frank. Hey, Mark. Como esta? I have no idea what that means. If you're listening uh, to this and uh, you know where you can find us, like on Spotify or Apple Music, uh, or excuse me, Apple Podcasts, uh, or wherever you find podcasts. That's right, Mark. New episodes drop to your ears and mine every Friday. And of course... They are for your listening pleasure. So for our new listeners out there, this is a podcast where Frank and I recommend albums to each other to review them. We have a wide variety of musical discussions like our Spotlight series, where we'll dig into a band's catalog and see what comes out on the other side. Or in our Versa series, where we pit two albums against each other, sometimes three, and duke it out for total stereo domination. I absolutely love it. Be sure to check us out on Instagram or on our new and improved Facebook group where we like to drop additional content that'll hopefully leave you wanting more of Frank's musical goodness and my personal random nonsense. If you've got a record for us you want us to check out, just drop us a comment wherever you find us. Uh, And while you're at it, make sure you subscribe and give us a rating, as many stars as it'll let you, or thumbs up or whatever people are doing these days. So I say this, Frank, how are you, my man? Listen, man, I am good. I, I've really been loving our recent episodes, and I'm excited for what we have mapped out in the future, my man. So I'm I'm doing fantastic. Yeah, me too, Frank. Me too. Tonight on the program, or today, depending on when you're listening to it, we're talking about The Interrupter's last album, Fight the Good Fight, uh, a recommendation, recommendation from Ross Gordon, the lead singer of The Cold Years. That's right. We know Ross Gordon of The Cold Years. Oh, yeah. Uh, We interviewed him last week. If you haven't listened to it, uh, you can pause now and just go back an episode, or you can listen to it afterwards. Uh, Really great chit-chatting with him, just like the old times. Right, Frank? Oh, it was fantastic. Now, one of the first things you'll notice about the band uh, as we were doing some research was that they're kind of a family band. Um, We'll get into the relations of the band uh, in a bit. But Frank and I thought it'd be fun to pull together a little top list of uh, family bands. Uh, Now, before we get into this, there are, excuse me, I am out of breath. Um, There have been a ton of great bands, uh, family bands over the years. The Jackson Five, Tony, 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 Three Days Grace, Tegan and Sarah, Switchfoot, The Stooges, Sly and the Family Stone, Sister Sledge, Radiohead, The Psychedelic Furs, The Pointer Scissors, fucking Nickelback. My Chemical Romance, The Meat Puppets, Cool in the Gang, Gladys Knight and the Pips. I think two of the Pips are related. Um, <laughs> I think they get it, right, Frank? Uh, why don't we um, kick it off with Numero Uno? And you can let the folks know who uh, who you're going to skip just out of prosperity or whatever. Absolutely. Well, Nickelback being one of them. Okay. <laughs> That's the only time we'll probably ever talk about them, right, Mark? Unless... Oh, God, I hope so. Uh, God, I hope so, too. So, because a couple episodes ago, we talked about Oasis. Listen, everyone knows they're brothers. Okay, I'm omitting Oasis. And I always mention the replacements, so I'm going to actually omit them as well. So, I'm going to try to do my best to bring up bands I don't talk about too much, but uh, I kind of do talk about them a lot, too. So, uh, first ones. You ready, Mark? Yep, yep. All right. So, first one, obviously... The Beach Boys. All right, so the Beach Boys, you have Brian, Dennis, and Carl Wilson, plus their cousin Mike Love. Now, Al the Pal Jardine was their close friend, so he wasn't related. But, I mean, how much more family members can you squeeze into this, right? Uh, Each one of the brothers were unique in their own ways, and they are totally fascinating to me, especially Dennis Wilson. So, um, yeah, that's my mark. The Beach Boys. Nice. I took a, I picked kind of also an equally, maybe not equally big band, but certainly um, a mainstream band people have heard of as my number one pick. My number one pick, uh, Pantera. Yeah. Arguably the heaviest band to come out of the Lone Star State. Uh, brothers Dimebag, Daryl, and Vinnie Paul spent their early years with one goal totally. uh, of being better than Van Halen. Uh, if you're into heavy fucking metal like I am, you know that they've succeeded. Um, though they don't get the mainstream recognition for being better than Van Halen they fucking are um and just before we go any further uh i will not be talking about the jackson five uh, yes. i will not mention van halen again uh or any boy bands uh which for me includes the kings of leon who fucking suck <laughs> number two frank yes number two and real quick back to pantera i mean they're they're a really pivotal band that i i i think it's underlooked a lot right mark is that, mm-hmm. is that fair to say you know i think uh and i don't want to blame you not blaming frank specifically I think they they came out in the early 90s and a lot of people 
throw that Nirvana banner up and go, Nirvana killed uh, hair metal. They, they saved rock and roll. And I think there are a lot of bands uh, that were very influential in that time. And I think Pantera was a big one in terms of bringing, uh, taking the hair out of metal and making it badass again. Yeah, maybe perhaps in a future episode, we dive into Pantera a little bit. Oh, we could, certainly. Okay, cool, cool. So the next one for me is Stone Temple Pilots. So you have Robert and Dean DeLeo. Uh, Robert in particular is such a... Was, is and still and was a vital force during the 90s of course time with the band uh dean's a great guitar player don't get me wrong but robert held down the rhythm with his precision bass playing and backing vocals particularly on that unplugged performance so yeah stone temple pilots you have the brothers robert and dean de leo yeah great choice great choice in fact i be honest with you that was one i did not know about yeah um so for me this one's i, I think most people know this acdc uh you know a lot of people uh, see Angus Young as the, the musical leader and, and mastermind behind that band with his powerful guitar solos and his, his amazing live performances. But it turns out Brother Malcolm uh, is really the one who wrote the bulk of the songs, um, laid down the bulk of the tracks and did most of the legwork. Now, unfortunately, Malcolm did pass away back in 2014. Uh, his nephew, uh, Stevie Young, has stepped in to fill in his shoes uh, and keep the band's family dynamic going on in there they are slated to be back in the studio yes. in fact, they may be done in the studio it's, it's unclear who's doing the songwriting uh, at this point but I'm, I'm anxious to see what it is uh 2020 acdc puts out yeah now yeah. is that is that nephew is that angus's uh, son is that who that is you know is, not entirely is that another sure. okay i'm not entirely sure uh, the, the research just said uh nephew but it had both of their names and then it said nephew so yeah What's cool, Malcolm, is he he uh, he has a signature Frankenstein guitar where he actually gutted kind of everything out, including the the, the pickups, which is crazy. Cool. Cause, yeah, he had such a signature sound. And although he was uh, sloshed half the time, he still was consistently playing, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, mm -hmm. he, he was he was cool. Um, all right. So my next is the Cramps. Um, first psychobilly band. Well, the Meteors may have something to say about that, I'm sure, as they always claim they are the first psychobilly band. Uh, band. Anyway, um, they, um, they're a married, married couple with the singer Lex Interior and Poison Ivy on guitar, um, and that lasted until Interior's death in 2009. So the Cramps, they are next on my list. Nice. I get a little bit of uh, number three for me is kind of a guilty pleasure. It's The Darkness. Oh, I love it. I yeah, brothers, tell me your uh, guilty pleasures. Tell me them. <laughs> yeah, uh, brothers Justin and Dan Hawkins uh, apparently received guitars one Christmas, mm. uh, and then you know, fast forward many years to 2003, and uh, I believe in a thing called love. Uh, literally rocketed up every everything uh, everywhere, every Billboard chart that there is to, to rocket up. Um, it, like I said, definitely an early 2000s guilty pleasure of mine. The Darkness. I, I still think their records are cool. They're a little. They're tongue in cheek, but that's what they they meant to do, and right. uh, I I kind of love it. That's awesome. We're gonna have to do a guilty pleasures list at some point, right? <laughs> oh yeah, we'll do a my shame is true list. That's for sure. I love it, love it. All right, so next is I have the Briggs, uh, Jason and Joey uh, Briggs. Uh, La Roca is is their is the proper name uh, each sharing lead vocals although joey's kind of more center stage a uh, great band here i'm still waiting for that uh, follow-up to 2008's uh, album come all you man man but uh, the briggs uh, you got two brothers jason and joey very nice my uh my next one's like four sisters and like five cousins all in one band uh, <laughs> that number is not accurate uh, it's this band called isley and you wouldn't guess that their name had been pulled from Star Wars, the, the legendary Mos Eisley Cantina. Uh, but it turns out that's that's what they say it is. Um, anyways, the band is made up uh, almost exclusively of family members, or at least originally. The original lineup was uh, all sisters, Sherry Dupree, Chantel Dupree, and Weston Dupree, with cousins uh, Garen Dupree and Remington Dupree Holy uh, also playing in the band. Uh, musically, Eisley is known for like an uh, ethereal, alt rock style sound okay uh, members change from time to time but they always seem to be like just another cousin or another sister that they've been hiding from somewhere else really cool um just kind of ethereal kind of fun rock band um much you know it, this is definitely one of those bands my wife was like check this out you'll like it and you'll be surprised that you like it and i was like oh shit okay and she was right so she told you to check out this record she did as a matter of fact <laughs> that that must be cool to have like a stockpile of like family members just in case like one leaves you could be like hey yeah. listen you know second cousin you're in now and mm -hmm. uh just kind of do it there and they're, and, 
and they're all really good. Like, no, you don't, like, you see the band and you're like, oh, well, that guy's on rhythm guitar for a reason. No, like, they're all really good. It's, it's really surprising. They should have a side band called the Duprees. You would think, I mean, <laughs> so this is actually, uh, for those of you who remember our Tall Heart episode, we talked about Max Bemis yeah. uh, being the producer on that. <laughs> Sherry Bemis is actually his wife. Got it, got it. So got there's, it. like, all kinds of musical. And they've got, like, uh, I, think, I think they're doing what you suggested. They're stockpiling children. Because they've got like nine of them now. So yeah, they do. Fun. Yeah. Um, they got the next so like four bands mapped out already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So it's pretty interesting. You know, it's like, um, yeah. I was gonna make a a joke about starting like a superior race of of children to be in bands, but I didn't want like a Nazi band joke to come out, so I'm just gonna leave it alone. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Sorry. Continue. Yeah. Continue. Next, I have the. <laughs> <laughs> Next, I have the Ava Brothers, a uh, band we'll, we'll be covering soon in an episode. Spoiler alert. Uh, you have uh, Seth and Scott Avit here. Uh, I mean, just they're a huge band. I mean, super popular. Uh, they're, they're more than just uh, folk music, especially in their recent releases. We're going to talk about that again in some future episodes here. But yeah, the Avit Brothers with Scott and Seth Avit. Yeah, I'm happy you brought up the Avit Brothers because I'm putting uh, the Wood Brothers on my list. Yeah. Uh, not just a clever name, they are actually brothers. Well, at least Chris and Oliver Wood are. Uh, third member, uh, Jano Ricks, which I probably said entirely wrong, is not related. But however, um, they're seen as uh, one of the most soulful acts in modern folk music. I really dig their 2013 album, The Muse. Really kind of cool in that vein of Avit Brothers, but you can kind of see that they if, if the Avid Brothers are going right, they're going left. If the Avid Brothers are going left, they're going right. They, they, Got they, they it. Okay. In on that very classic kind of three-piece setup, um, you know, with the additional in instruments as needed, but really cool band, the Wood Brothers. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Good. I'll check out that release for sure. Next here we have, let me see, Peyton Manning and Eli. Oh, sorry. That's that's a football list, Mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Next we have or <laughs> Pat Benatar and Neil Gerardo. Uh, so, all right, no vacationing with Pat Benatar and the Pocono story here, folks. Okay. Uh, listen, 30 plus years of their relationship and still going strong. Pretty impressive. That's all I have to say. Husband and wife, they've been playing together for ages. Pat Benatar and Neil Chiadro. You know, it's really interesting how our lists are mirroring each other because my next one's Devo, and none of the members of Devo are married to each other. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. It's a. Um, I, I just like any excuse to talk about how awesome Devo is. Yeah. Uh, they actually have two sets of brothers in the band, uh, Mark and Bob, a.k.a. Bob One, uh, Mothersboro, as well as Gerald and, and Bob Two, Casal. Uh, unfortunately, Bob Two passed away in 2017. Uh, yeah. but Devo still rules. They're still rocking on at where and when possible. Um, just go listen to fucking Devo. Yeah, I mean, Mark's right on that. I, I yeah. don't disagree there. Uh, one of our very episodes, uh, early episodes, Mark was on this next band, Greta Van Fleet. Right. Uh, so we have three brothers in the band, twins, Josh and Jake Kiska. <laughs> and I saw that. And brother Sam, uh, you can check out our episode uh, of them in the old archives. And that's where people probably started to get maybe aggravated with us. But there you go. Greta Van Fleet. Uh, as you got a bunch of brothers. Yeah, band still sucks. <laughs> there you go. You know who doesn't suck, Frank? Who? The Kinks. The, oh, the Kinks, of course. Yeah. The Kinks, on the other hand, are one of my favorite 60s rock bands founded by brothers Ray and Dave Davies. Mm. Uh, they cut some great tunes like La 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 La. I promise that's all the singing I'll do today. Oh. Uh, and you really got me now. Uh, they paved the way for rock and roll that didn't involve formulaic bullshit song structures or yeah. lyrical content. Lola's Go check great, out the man. Kings. Lola's great. Next is actually one of my favorite bands, Mark, uh, Dire Straits, right? So you have Mark, not you. You have Mark mm. and David Knopfler. Uh, ironically enough, uh, they weren't, as their song goes, brothers in arms, as David left the group after the band's third album. Uh, I could only imagine being overshadowed by one of the greatest guitar guitarists of all times, who happens to be the singer as well. So I could imagine that was a little challenging as the, the dynamic. But from what I hear, it was a slow uh, building burn as opposed to a big blow up. But at some point, they were in the band together, Mark and David Knopfler, Dire Straits. Yeah, so for me, uh, this is one of my favorite one-hit wonders. Um, the the uh, blah, 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 tripping over my tongue. The Proclaimers. Oh, twins, Frank. Twins. Scottish twins. Scottish identical twins. Should have talked to Ross about them. Yeah, born March fifth, nineteen sixty-two. They go on to give us the massive hit. I'm gonna be five hundred miles. That's right. Uh, 
Well, that's uh, what they're most known for. The, the band uh, actually started as an acoustic duo, but would add the full band later uh, on their album, Sunshine on Lathe. Pretty sure that's how you say Lathe, um, uh, which housed uh, their first hit. They previously mentioned, I'm going to be 500 miles. Uh, it even got a second run up the charts right. used in the soundtrack for Benny and June. Benny and June. Um, well, they haven't had any uh, hits as big. Uh, the twins have been releasing musically consistently over the years. In fact, uh, in 2018, they released an album, Angry Cyclist, which uh, I checked out and I was like, oh, you know, that's not too bad. Nice. Yeah. It, that song, 500 Miles, is fascinating because it was originally released in like the late 80s. And then the Benny and mm-hmm. June soundtrack blew it up like five years later. And that's, mm-hmm. yeah, it's crazy because it's actually, it wasn't a new song at the time. It was a couple of years, a couple of years old. Yeah. Um, but cool. Good band. Uh, next, we have Heart. And and Nancy Wilson, uh, I mean, they were actually massive in the '80s. What's astonishing is that they they date back to 1973. That's pretty that's pretty crazy. If uh, you know, I think a lot of people associate hard with the '80s hits, Barracuda and Alone and all those things. Uh, Anne is the primary singer, but Nancy is absolutely no slouch at all. So they're both talented singers. And Hart, there you go, the sister's hey, Hart. Do you remember when Hart did when they did that? Uh cover a stairway to heaven for the rock and roll hall of fame i do Whatever that was that was badass man yeah no very good job uh proof that robert plant's completely replaceable anyways number nine for me uh i i too went with sister band from the 80s i went with the bangles the bangles yeah buddy sisters vicky and debbie peterson gave mm. us those amazing 80s pop masterpieces eternal flame mm-hmm. manic monday and of course walk like an egyptian totally yeah, I feel like uh, I'm on a roller coaster. Or, oh, no, roller coaster. I'm, I'm on the roller skating rink, just just saying the names of the songs, just like I know. boogieing on down like an Egyptian. It's just like instant nostalgia. Staples, man. Staples <laughs> of the 80s. My last one is the band In Excess. So uh, I've been told, I've been told, uh, they were actually a different band prior to their massively popular album Kick, almost kind of a new wave ska style group. Uh, I've heard a couple of tracks from there. I I have to dig into it more, but I did hear they were kind of a totally different band prior to what most came to know. Uh, Anyway, you have three brothers, Andrew, John, and Tim Ferriss, not to be confused with the author of the four hour work week, Tim Ferriss. There you go. Yeah. So for me, number 10 is the breeders. The breeders. Uh, Yeah. Found him deal. (laughs) Found it as a way for Pixies bassist Kim deal and uh, throwing music guitarist Tanya Donnelly. Uh, to let some of their suppressed creative energies out. The band also included Kim's sister, Kelly. Yeah. Uh, Kelly Deal, excuse me, who famously couldn't play guitar when she joined the band. Uh, best known for their song, Cannonball. They were uh, easily one of the most underrated alternative acts of the early 90s. Um, the band has developed an unmistakable signature sound uh, and yeah. continues to release albums. I believe they also had a 2018 release. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, wow. We really learned a lot there, didn't we, Frank? Totally, totally. I mean, a lot of bands that we knew had uh, relations, uh, family members, all these things, and then other bands where we just absolutely had no idea. So it's always yeah. fun, always fun to dig into that stuff. Yeah, anyways, it's time to uh, dive, as you say, into the main event, the Interrupters, fight the good fight. Yep. What was your uh, What was your first impression, Frank? All right. So years ago, can't remember mm-hmm. when, but years ago, Tim Armstrong was on one of those satellite radio stations uh, he was hosting, and he had the Interrupters and, and interviewed him. Obviously, you know. My mind was like, all right, is this kind of like the Distillers, but a newer version of them? But anyway, I remember Amy mentioning how they were like, they were a big family. And I like that, obviously, because that's a big value to me. Uh, But before I get to the music, what I dug about them and when I found out more about them, as they were actually a family, plus having a big Italian background, which I jug, uh, which I dug that genuine aspect of them. Uh, Amy's story is interesting as well. She was a solo artist and was discovered right by Randy Jackson. She has some uh, writing credits with the band Unwritten Law. Now, when I gave this record a spin, Mark, I was like, man, this is what I want from my ska. This is what I want. You could draw comparisons to the way she sing, the way she sings to Tim Armstrong, which is fair and welcome, to, in my opinion. Um, th- this is rancid style of that classic two-tone ska feel that I like. It has the foundation of the specials, again, meaning rancid. That's the best way I could describe it. So it was different to me than the third wave big, Real big fish, mighty boss tones uh, style. The, the that's you know this guy is is checkered style with more grit 
and uh, on reliance on the horns, although the horns are there at times. So initially, I loved the sound overall. It was fun. It was fun just to put on this record and let it ride and something you could put on again at a party and dance away with, Mark. So that was my first impression. Wow, Frank's going to let it ride, folks. Um, <laughs> so as Frank mentioned, there are uh, they are family, in fact. Uh, singer Amy in interrupter as she is credited on the record is uh, the only one not related by blood. The rest of them, uh, the core band there, uh, Kevin on guitar, Justin on bass and Jesse Benova. Yep. Bivona. Uh, I don't know. Bivona. Um, Bivona. Bivona uh, on drums. They're actually all brothers. However, Amy and Kevin are married, not to mention Justin and Jesse are twins. Holy moly, Frank. Keeps going. Uh, a twins rhythm section. Anyways, Fight the Good Fight is the band's third album. It was produced by longtime collaborator and friend Tim Armstrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, and was released through Epitaph and Hellcat Records in 2018. Once again, I'm going to ask uh, my good buddy Frank uh, to kick us off with a review, Frank. All right, cool. So here we go, Mark. So we got the first track. It's called Title Holder. Right off the bat. Again, we get, we get this rancid-style modern special sound. I hear one Mr. Lars Fredrickson in the background, so that was very warming to my ears. Thank you, Lars. Appreciate you. Uh, I love the short, punchy nature of the song and the theme title holder. Right away, I'm thinking that arena of boxing. I also associate it with classic old-school vibes, which this song showcases. So I like the meshing of that. It's a nice, fun beginning to the album. What about you, my man? Yeah, you nailed it. Uh, you know, very cool, punchy. Pun intended, fun ska number. Uh, I really dig the guitar solo and the bridge into that last chorus out. Really well put together. Uh, simple and effective lyrics uh, about getting back up and doing your best. You know, yeah, a, a lot it. of what you'll hear me say this, a lot of what we fell in love with punk rock for in the first place. Uh, track number two is called So Wrong. Uh, this song does a lot of a little, excuse me, this song does a lot of little things, uh, but it does them all so fucking well. Fans of the show will know how much uh, I, I love a good clap part, uh, but the harmonies here are spot on as well. Uh, we are treated to another really well-timed and well-played guitar solo. Simple song about uh, owning that you've made a mistake and, and trying to do the right thing. Yeah, I love Tim's production. Really, his, 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 his ear for that is, is awesome. I hear lots of rancid here. So I'm curious, of course, all the writing credits of how much, uh, if any, did Tim contribute to which we talked about that that there was. Uh, again, I like the production. I like how it's not shiny and so flashy. Um, the guitars, they, they just sound great here. They're not overpowering, but you could hear what's going on. And that's what I like about it. And again, Mark, you nailed it. The Brothers Harmonies uh, towards the end, really well thought out, really good put together. Just, just a cool song. Um, She's kerosene. So I normally, you know, we always talk about, right? The singles aren't necessarily the ones I like the best on the album. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I love the absolute shit out of the song. I really do. It's it's exactly, again, how I like my ska. Amy does her best Tim Armstrong mixed with Shane McGowan vocal performance, which I think a lot of Tim's came from Shane McGowan in that way of singing. Um, but I love the chord progression, the B minor, the G, the D to the A. It's always catchy. It's one of my favorites to play. You could play this at a party. You could have a good time skanking with your friends. It's fun, catchy, smart, just a great tune. And live, I listened to it several times live, they reproduce it spot on, man, perfectly well. And the twin brothers, um, and Kevin, again, they do a great job with the backup vocals. So I, I really love this tune, man. Yeah, awesome. Um, you know, again, really crystal clear Tim Armstrong influence here. Uh, he did produce the record. He does have uh, kind of a blanket writing credit. Frank and I had some issues trying to find exact writing right. credits for this, but um, he does have a blanket one. So it's safe to say he definitely had some influence directly on it. Uh, one of the things I love about this song is that while it appears like a, a song of caution because she's kerosene, uh, it takes the responsibility of, narr uh, of the narrator to acknowledge um, that he is the match or, or she is the match. Yeah, uh, She's gonna burn down everything. Uh, it's the narrator's responsibility to get away from her. I like that the song uh, yeah. can have that kind of uh, retrospective view that you know we're not, yes, this uh, theoretically woman is explosive and is uh, a can of kerosene, but uh, it is the the match's responsibility to do so, to get away yeah. as opposed to the kerosene. I, I just really like that. That uh, is, that's a cool perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, track number four is Leap of Faith. Uh, I love how much this sounds like the specials. Uh, 
like super clean classic two-tone upstroke guitars the reverb the reverb excuse me the horns uh really fun song lyrically i really dig that amy isn't preaching on behalf of any faith rather well, that, that faith should be uh kept inward and that we should be believing in ourselves love that absolutely love that aspect of it uh, i got some life won't wait kind of feel here it's kind of spooky ska vibe i don't know if i was listening to the songs life won't wait and um and crane fist in particular i think maybe on a tone side but listen i love the song uh, next to she's kerosene it could be one of my favorites on here i love the chanting vocals during the chorus repeating the leap of faith leap of faith love that again vocal performance is spot on uh it shows the talent and if you were listening to her stuff prior to the interrupters you could see how she can really do so much just with her voice i love the horns how it comes in and gives it even more of a groove uh, i just i can't listen to this and not just move around so a ska like this i think is why we love uh, a song like this is why we love ska i was gonna say a ska like this is why we love song but a song like this yeah. is, I mean, why, that's not wrong either. <laughs> is why we love ska um so great Next track has got each other. Another fun, later, kind of rancid style song. We get Tim, we get Lars, even Matt Freeman on vocals as well. Um, not so much to say. I mean, like, listen, it's it's simple. And I wonder I wonder how often, though, this song makes a live set uh, performance because of all those guest performances. But I guess Kevin, who I've seen live, uh, like on the track Family, for example, he he does a lot of those uh, lyrics. It's it's another fun, fun tune. What can I say? Yeah, it's kind of uh, that classic punk rock unity song that registered so deeply deeply with me when i first found punk rock yeah well, let's face it it's it's entirely a rancid reunion so that that didn't hurt and just really made it <laughs> um, just kind of really fun felt like you got a cameo in the middle of your record and it was cool yeah uh track number six broken world um i really dig this track just more of that kind of positive energy that upbeat yeah. rhythm uh cool little nugget of trivia on this one uh, Kevin said that while waiting for a flight after playing some shows in which they were opening for Green Day in Chile, uh, Billy Joe Armstrong uh, showed them the idea for the song, uh, played them a few bits of it and said, uh, I really think this would be a cool interrupter song. And I got to agree, it's a pretty cool interrupter song. <laughs> it's a highlight on the album for me, for sure. Lots of energy. Great, great, great message. Uh, it's a catchy tune. Keep you singing it. And it's a great, listen, it's a great track to blast loud in the house, preferably uh, that whole skanking while you're cleaning. So if you need to do that, folks, definitely do it. It's, it's a great track. In fact, I had it on the other day while well, skanking and cleaning. Yeah, for our younger listeners who, uh, who aren't familiar with skanking, it is a type of dance and not simply um, acting slutty in your neighborhood. Yeah, it's, it's, thank you. It's a type of dance. Correct. <laughs> thank you. I don't fact, want people to think that you're like turning tricks while cleaning your house, right? No, no, absolutely not. In fact, if you go on, if you go on Spotify and um, play She's Kerosene and then you, um, uh, you'll see like a quick little uh, clip of the video and you could see the shadows of all of them in the background actually doing what's called skanking. So uh, it's pretty cool to see. Or, you know, you can go to uh, listen to some mustard plug Oh, and, and um, put on the track skanking by numbers, and they'll teach you how to be a skank or how to. How oh, to skank. Damn oh. you! Or, <laughs> or I have another or for us. Where right. yeah. you can listen to our ska episode in the archives. Yeah. yeah. Where we also do a little skanking and yeah, we do a little skank. I, we need to be maybe the next time we do a ska album, we'll do like instructions on skanking. Okay, that that sounds. Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll just listen to skanking okay. by numbers. <laughs> <laughs> uh gave you everything then, that's the next track there you go <laughs> all right so this song for some reason is the band touching on that potential uh that that and to me this equated to that they're just going to keep getting bigger and uh bigger it's got a lot of elements that um that has like a lot of airplay written on it to me and i could see it i could see this style of song on future albums if they happen to abandon ska that's if like a major label right gets a hold of them um i like how the solo takes it up an octave and finishes with the chorus in that higher octave um my girls really like this one as well i, I it's a good track good track what about you mark yeah, this just sounded like a, a classic, super clean uh, pop rock song to me. Uh, you know, if TRL were still a thing, this would have been, uh, you know, the top of the list, as it were. Uh, I can kind of, like, I didn't really get when you mentioned earlier that Randy Jackson had found her. I didn't really understand what was going on there. I, I didn't bother to listen to her stuff beforehand, just because I didn't want to distract myself with it. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, I gotcha. In terms of this kind of... Um, 
pop star vocal ability and performance, I think she's she's definitely got it. Yeah. Um, you know, these guys could be a really cool pop man if, if they so chose to be. I just hope that they keep the uh, the Scott roots. I hope so, man. And um, you know, and and hopefully uh, it gets uh, better and not bigger, or, or bigger and better. How's that? I don't want to wish negative on it. There you go. Uh, there you go. So uh, number eight is not personal, as that comment about them wasn't personal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, not at all. Really, okay. <laughs> this for me i don't think was one of my favorite songs on the album uh you can really feel tim armstrong on the song especially uh with the the lyrics chosen and the phrasing of them um yeah i see that still delivered well and i i dig that it got you know, kind of a faster tempo which broke up the the rest of the album uh from being you know kind of very monotonous in terms of what the tempos of the song were it really did a good job of turning it up uh it just leaned a little too heavy on that tim sound for me and i kind of lost the interrupters and only heard tim yeah and my comments here is i hate i hate to keep saying that it's another rancid style song but but it is and i think that exactly what you were saying that's how it's trickling now to getting kind of this really tim pronounced sound on on many of the songs it's not bad in any way it's short it's quick energetic it's a fun song to dance to but you know yeah i found a lot of similarities in what you're saying uh, next, we have Outrage. I'd say it's probably my favorite pure punk song on the album. Uh, it's got that old kind of street uh, style, which Rancid and some oi bands made popular. Uh, the palm muting tone is just perfect. I really like how Tim and uh, Kevin uh, are concentrated on ensuring that it all sounds nice and even. And I, 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 I must say that this is one of the better sounding records I've listened to lately. And I'm going to give props to Tim on that because I, I just really like the way he he handles all the sounds here. Yeah, I don't know if it's, I've been wearing this de Descendants hat too much. I totally thought this song was called Outage. Oh, that's <laughs> that's Outrage. That's Not, awesome. like, I don't know, it's just my brain and my dyslexia. Um, but definitely a, a great sounding record. Um, this just feels a little generic compared to the rest of the album um, we've been hearing up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for me, I, I'm in a little bit of a two song slump, but fortunately I, I kind of like the next song um, so we're going to just jump right into rumors and gossip. Uh, I'm happy that we're back to a little bit more of an up-tempo dance hall style groove. Uh, Andy's putting in a lot of lyrical work here, uh, but it but it works uh, much better than I thought the way they kind of forced it in the uh, very Tim sounding track above. Nothing incredible, uh, but nothing overly generic or cliche. It just really works to a great song, great vibe. Uh, I'd love to see this live. Yeah, I see. Uh... <clears throat> I had here that this could be my potential filler song on the album. Um, sure. I would say it's this one. I mean, listen, you're, you're right. There is some, there's some basic nuances to it. It's nothing new that we've heard before. I think on the album at this point uh, rumors and gossip, the concept, the theory, it's frequently talked about subject and, and mm -hmm. songs. Um, it's still fun and dance worthy, uh, you know, again, to, to skank to, um, yeah, not much all to, to say other than it live though. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, Oh, I don't want to hear this live. I'd be like, yeah, uh, bring it on you know so yeah. next we have be gone uh it's a cool bass riff um when the guitars and organs man i love the organs and when that comes in it's super super cool i, I want to say there's early no doubt vibes and when i say that i mean it's that first album prior to tragic kingdom when i had like more band members and more of a pronounced ska sound um but yeah that's my thoughts on be gone yeah i'm really digging this up tempo pace uh and, and it kind of it swings uh, into what frankly uh, picked up is that that really early pre-poppy uh, no doubt kind of chorus totally um i love how the band can kind of shift tempo seamlessly and, and it keeps the song moving they do a really great job of of shifting through styles and song uh sounds on this one i really dug it track 12 room with a view mm -hmm. not to be confused with uh room without a window room without a window i totally i totally made the yeah that comparison yeah, too we want to tie everything back to operation ivy yeah uh, you know, uh, I like that they, they chose to, you know, I just talked about how they were able to shift up and really kind of change up their speeds. I love that they shifted way down, toning the tempo back. Yeah, me too, uh, actually. To close the record out. Uh, I just thought it was a really good choice. Uh, there aren't many slower tracks on the album, so it was nice to have one. Clearly not a ballad, uh, but, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be. Uh, Well-paced, uh, kind of yeah, a yeah. lament. Doesn't need to be just an acoustic guitar and a singer. This, this is a great example of a full band rocking out to a to a personal song it's just really well done yeah absolutely and um it, speaking of operation ivy real quick i've seen on some of their live sets we get uh they'll do time bomb from rancid then they'll 
do a sound system by Op Ivy, which is nice. which is really which is really cool. Uh, it's a cool song to end the album, and Amy does a great job with the rough vocals. I like the whole. I know you have a you got a room with the view up there, and you've been looking down on me. It's again hopeful message, which is a lot on this record, which to me is very welcomed uh, for those especially who have lost someone. So um, it's a great way to end the album. So room with a view. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, why don't you go ahead, Frank, and start us off with your uh, your final thoughts there? I think I will, Mark. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that'd, be, that'd be lovely, please. <laughs> so listen, they've been on my radar for a while. It's just one of those things because, Mark, listen, we listen to so much music and sometimes, you know, you mentally want to listen to these bands, but you don't have the time to sit down and listen to them. So I'm glad we had, I had the chance too to sit down and listen to them. I think they're a super fun throwback to the two-tone days of ska with a flair of rancid. I think they have tremendous, tremendous upside um, and will continue to grow and become even more popular than they are now. Uh, the fact that they are a family, to me personally, is awesome and they all seem like super super humble individuals that's awesome as well uh, i watched again the entire live set from the 2000 uh from 2019 and they were all smiles all having a good time they interacted with the crowd they really gave the crowd a personal experience amy was coming out and shaking hands with people uh kevin was there with people the twins were doing their thing just really really cool that engagement is important uh it shows that they're real people uh, i could see that there's some major label appeal and that could cause some changes musically in the future. I don't know though, not predicting it. It could. Uh, and I hope that change doesn't occur with the Scott tunes as we were talking about earlier. Cause I think they do it really, really well. Uh, so again, I hope that doesn't happen, but this album is super fun and great to play loudly in the house. As I said, many times it made me want to dance and that's what ska should do in one facet. In my opinion, uh, I would love to pick up this vinyl. It's a good album and I enjoy their others as well. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm really happy Ross tossed this one out for us. Um, I really enjoyed all their records uh, so far. And it's uh, really fun to take a deep look at the band and just really kind of uh, peel them open. They really encompass that old school feeling of punk rock and ska, uh, of being uh, yourself and, and helping your fellow man and, and you know, helping yep. them get on their feet and, uh, you know, um, and not accepting things because you're told to. Um, you know, they really kind totally. of carry that classic energy. Uh, bands like that are the reason I fell in love uh, with the genre. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from them. Um, you'd mentioned that your girls uh, liked a few of the tracks and, and the, the Billie Eilish she's covered, or whatever her name is. Um, Billie Eilish. Yeah, whatever, I'm never gonna say it right. Um, so is this a band uh, you can see trying to get them to listen to more? Do you think you're going to try to talk your girls into listening to less pop music using the interrupters? <laughs> the, the interrupters are my segue to getting them to like more, uh, more yeah. of the music I like. <laughs> <laughs> it, it could be. Listen, I'm playing that a lot in the car for them, um, which again, I'm, I'm watching how I do it because I don't want to also overplay it to then they completely go in the opposite direction as well. Uh, so, you know, I have to embrace the pop, <laughs> but also to kind of thread it in naturally with, with these little things like the Billie Eilish color cover, which they like, and she's Carol's kerosene. That's kind of the one and two that I'm going into. And then I'm going to like add a third song in there eventually and, and just start threading it. Um, nice. they're, they're picking up on it though, for sure. Uh, and cool. it's a, and it's a band I will continue to play for them. Um, it just, um, you know, I have to let them bully the jukebox a little bit too. <laughs> there you go. You, would you, uh, I know I'm asking a lot from you this week. Would you care to, to tell our dear listeners what we're up to next week? Yeah, no, absolutely. So obviously in our last episode, we interviewed Ross from the cold years. So now we're going to go back and take a look at the debut album, Paradise. Uh, and we're going to go track by track. So we're going to do one of our track by track episodes and review on the album because we talked about the album and we talked to Ross about a whole wide variety of things. But now we're going to talk specifically about the album. And we got some cool things in there too, where we're going to bring up some bands that I feel have, or maybe have not. That's why we're going to talk about it. Kind of bridge this gap between rock and roll and, and punk and kind of created uh, maybe a heartland sound. But anyway, we're going to have some cool discussions about it and we're going to go track by track and it should be interesting. And um, I'm amped for it. What about you, Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I really liked the album. Uh, I really like that we got to have that discussion with Ross. Uh, and I think you know, it, it's interesting uh, as you, hopefully the listeners at home or wherever you may be, we, we tell you what album we're going to listen to. Hopefully you throw the album on, you listen to it, you dig into it a little bit. Oh, yeah. It's not often you get to sit down with the guy, chat with him, 
pick his brain about it, and then come back to the record yeah. and, and rediscover it again. So it's going to be a really great show. I'm really happy uh, we got to talk to him because it, it, I mean, this for Frank and I, if nothing else, even if we're the only ones listening at this point, um, I think it, we don't get to review records in this manner. Uh, and it, it presents a really interesting uh, and fun dynamic. So um, that's the show. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, if you've got a minute to help us out by liking and sharing the show, we'd appreciate it. Remember, if uh, we each get 10 friends to listen and then they get 10 friends to listen and then they get 10 friends to listen, well, oh, yeah. we've, started, we've started a pyramid scheme, haven't we? <laughs> On that note, bye-bye. Ciao. <laughs> I love it. Love it. <laughs>